And welcome back. Time now to talk politics. I've got two farmers at our political roundtable. So, of course, we're going to talk about health care. How about that instead of agriculture? Uh, Democratic Representative Michael John Gray is the House Minority Leader. And we have uh, of Augusta and our uh, State Senator Brian King of Green Forest. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. All right. So we've had some fun over the last couple of weeks reading 350, 450 page reports from consultants that uh, have been paid by the state to come up with all kinds of interesting insights on Medicaid reform, the private option. Senator King, I will come to you first. What, what was your big takeaway from the Stephen Group's uh, report? Uh, one, they found out information that I knew when I was audit chairman, we did an early audit of the private option enrollees, just trying to get a sample of what was going on. We knew that there was problems going on and we come to find out there is. And you have uh, 42,000 people that have out of state addresses. You have dead people on the private option people that have died and then turn around and sign up. Uh, you know, Border County up there, we've known that there's been people in Missouri, live in Missouri, but yet uh, Arkansas taxpayers are paying for their health care. So we knew this was going on and they've kept it covered up. So when this Aurora Leak thing came out, it stunned a lot of people because of the numbers. Mm-hmm. It, you know, somebody in every state in the union on Arkansas Medicaid. I mean, that's unacceptable. And the fact is that, you know, they've been keep covering it up and keeping it from the legislature so they can get votes and win elections. All right, so your big takeaway is the problems with the private option or Medicaid. What was your big takeaway from the Stephen Group report? So Rob, uh, the big takeaway is that while there was a lot to digest from that report, and I think opponents and proponents of the private option could find their side argued well in the report, but touching on, I'd have to agree with Senator King, there, there was some question about verification, but what was interesting, one of the takeaways from that is it looked like almost 8% mm-hmm. issue in our report. The national average on verification like that is 7%. So with a relatively new program, my big takeaway with even all the issues we've had in verification and enrollment issues, we're getting pretty close to getting in line with the national average. Of course, we want to be better than the average, but we're not as bad as maybe people think we are. But to both of you, do you think that that problem is correctable should the private option go forward? Can we clean up those eligibility roles? Um, how do you go about doing that? And Uh, Do you think it's a problem that can be solved? You know, it's going to be difficult because you're not talking about traditional Medicaid where somebody's disabled or elderly or a child. Uh, These people move in and out of the state. I mean, it's a very, that income level is very fluid and, and, you know, can be here for two months and and gone. And so it's going to be very difficult with the, you know, unless you have real-time auditing. I mean, Obamacare only requires you to do one time a year uh, re-verification on their income. So that right there poses a problem. And the, the thing about it is you can talk about other states, but in the real world, if you work for a company and you have those kind of numbers and those kind of things, you're going to get fired. Yeah. Governor Hutchinson talked about doing rolling audits, though, versus just a set period in the time of year. How do you correct the eligibility problem? So I don't I absolutely don't have the solution, but I think it is a, something that can be addressed. You, real time with the IT issues we've had, I don't know if that's realistic, but some kind of rolling audit. The governor's got a point that I think we can do it a little better than what we did this time and address some of those issues. Would we like to get it absolutely perfect? I think we all would, but I think there's, at some point, we can get it better than it is. Now. All right, I'm going to ask a question that I think you guys are going to disagree on, but well, let's find out. I'm going to come to you first, Representative Gray. Should the private option continue? Because the report said it will save the state money, $438 million, despite some of these problems. Should the PO continue? I think with the governor's budget and the plan we have and the fact that over a quarter million Arkansans are joint insurance, rural hospitals. This is not just about health care. It's about economic development and work in our rural areas. So in some form within the budget, the private option should continue. Should it continue? No. And I think when you look at Medicaid and that it should be for the elderly, the children, and the truly disabled, not for able-bodied working age adults. We've seen in the private option some of the things that Governor Beebe and the architects misled us on. It wasn't going to disincentivize people to work. 100,000 people are on zero dollar income. In the real world, people are quitting their jobs uh, so they can get on this insurance, and it's going to be bad. You can look at it on state savings, and that just tells one half the story. We're relying on the federal government, federal deficits at all time high. The reality is that when you look at these bills that are paid and how they tout some of the positive things about it, 
It's just been paid by future generations with more debt. It's like having a hospital bill, walking out of the hospital bill, but before you do, go down to the maternity ward, hand that newborn baby a new debt to pay. I think that's unacceptable. Well, we, we are borrowing from the federal government or a lot of other state government programs mm -hmm. too, roads, education, some other things that we could point. Are you advocating that we don't do those things too? No, infrastructure, roads, those things keep the economy going. When you talk about able-bodied working age adults, those people can make a decision the same way I was in my 20s made a decision to go to work for a company and, and sign up on health insurance. You can look in the classifieds in, in the paper. There are people wanting jobs with these opportunities. Employers back home are having trouble filling jobs because uh, they come in there and they go over the income limit. Well, they don't want to work. And that's why you see it's not for the working poor. 100,000 people earn zero dollar income on the private option. Would you argue that people making 138% of federal poverty level are still poor? I would argue that that 100,000 number is not necessarily fair. I don't, we'd, we'd need to see the numbers on how many of those are maybe college students, non-working spouses that are at home taking care of a family. And let's, let's get real numbers here. If it's truly 100,000 able body, I think the governor wants to address that with some opportunities for work refor referral and there's some opportunities there for workforce training. I think to scrap the program over 100,000 that may or may not be an accurate number, may be a little early to start thinking that way. All right, one more big picture question for you guys as we wind up here. Uh, John Seelig announcing his resignation from the Department of Human Services by the end of this year. DHS is a big agency. It is a hard agency to manage. It's been that way since the beginning of time. Um, a person with the skill set to run the, the Department of Human Services can make much more money in the private sector. It's gonna be hard to attract a very high caliber person for that job. I'm not saying that the pay is not you know, good pay, but is DHS too big? Do either of you think that DHS should be broken out into some smaller agencies to become more manageable, particularly with all the contract problems we've seen? Um, Senator King, I come to you first. Yeah, in my 10 years down here, I think you see sometimes these mergers don't work out in the long run. And, and one of the bills that I have on doing redetermination, it sep separates out to a separate agency. You don't need those type people reporting to the same people that administer the program. They need to be independent people that do the redetermination so that they do a good job because some of the things that we've been misled on the private option is that they've kept these enrollees on here to make the program look more successful. So you're for, you're for breaking, for breaking up, some. up some of this. What about you? I'm not opposed to breaking it up, probably, but for a different reason. I think if we're going to break it up that you can put the person that's in charge of this in a level where you can get higher pay. Right now, not being at a cabinet level position, the, the pay scale is what it is. And if we want to attract the best and the brightest of this position, the only, I think one of the advantages of breaking up is being able to pay them a little more to do it. You have to pay them what a TV personality makes. That's big money right there. I'm right. telling you, you can eat at McDonald's if you want to with your whole family. So, mm -hmm. All right, Representative Michael John Gray, Senator Brian King, thank you both for being here. Appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we thank you for watching this morning. You can catch replays of today's interviews as well as all of our daily reporting on business and politics at our website at talkbusiness.net. I hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, I'm Roby Brock. Take care.